exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, so I, <coughs> I'm keeping my fingers crossed that my internet's working here in uh, little old Wivenhoe. Um, anyway, uh, my name is Phil Cohen. I'm uh, the research director of Living Maps, and um, I'm delighted to uh, to see you all and to uh, be able to introduce our, our speakers uh, tonight. Um, I'll just say a few words by, by way of introduction um, about the series and about this particular event. So, um, so we've been running these these uh, online events uh, since practically the beginning of, of lockdown, uh, first lockdown, um, and we've titled the series "Frontlines Backyards" because we wanted to look at how issues that are very visibly on the front lines, obviously issues of of the environment and of public health, how those uh, issues are cut cutting across um, uh, what have been seen as backyards whether it's academia or the arts world or wherever people call home so we wanted to sort of indeed problematize the whole relationship between front lines and backyards and we've been inviting um a whole a whole bunch of people from around the world scholar activists counter mappers um to present their work in progress and uh, tonight i'm delighted to welcome a group of artists and activists from australia and new zealand who've been developing new ways of questioning, questioning the colonial uh, through their mapping practices. Now, in the last few years, the legacy of colonialism has, of course, once more become a major issue. I mean, in a sense, it never went away, but it's now become very much a sort of frontline issue, but one which is about backyards. Uh, we might say the empire has been striking back on many fronts, from decolonizing the curriculum to taking down statues of slavers, from challenging institutional racism to insisting that black lives matter. Cartography has long been recognized as a major instrument of settler colonialism and empire building. But in the case of Australia, um, particularly perhaps, its role hasn't until recently been given as much intention as it deserves. Um, there was a rather brilliant book by somebody called Paul Carter, um, which pioneered the study of the reimagination and renaming of the Australian landscape by white painters and surveyors. Um, but interest and their role, um, you know, interestingly, that in that book, which is a lot about painting, and quite a lot about surveying, um, there's not very much about cartography, or the role that cartography played um, its performative role in erasing the indigenous cartographies of the first Australians. So the development of counter mapping practices in this highly contested terrain is a, a really urgent task and one that of course is fraught with ethical, aesthetic and political complexities. So that's why I'm delighted uh, to welcome um, our contributors, our four contributors, who've all got up heroically early. I mean it's six o'clock this time but I think in in Australia it's about two in the morning so you know our really great thanks for them for for making this effort to share with us their current work and with and to wrestle with some of these complexities and they'll be discussing the ongoing effects and effects and affects of, col of colonization on the politics of culture ecology and place so we've got three presentations um, and each presentation is going to last about half an hour. Now, if you have a, a question or a comment as a presentation is being made, please put it in the chat uh, uh, section. We're going to have a, a Q and A discussion at the very end, and we'll troll through. You know, we'll go back through the the um, all the comments. So, if, if you make an early on comment, don't worry, it won't be forgotten. We'll we'll certainly come to that um, in in the discussion. So our first presentation uh, is from Linda Knight, um, and she's entitled it Inefficient Mapping as an Ethical Wayfinding Practice. And the very title, and I think one of her key um, uh, concepts, uh, and which in fact she's, um, she's just bringing out a book uh, on, the th on the theme of inefficient mapping. And of course that's enough to give most conventional cartographers or Cartesian cartographies, the heebie-jeebies, the whole notion that mapping could be inefficient. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, from uh, Linda 
uh, about exactly what she, what she means and what's involved and what's uh, entailed in the practice of inefficient mapping uh, in relation to the project of colonialization. So Linda. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. And hopefully you can see that okay. Is somebody want to give me a thumbs up that they can see that okay? Yeah, great. So um, I'm going to um, talk about inefficient mapping as an ethical wayfinding practice because it is uh, the middle of the night here and because um, I am quite uh, old now, um, I'm going to read a little bit as well so that my brain, um, well, just to help my brain out a bit. Um, so I'll just play the slideshow. Okay. So the first thing that I need to do is um, uh, give an acknowledgement of country. This is a very important aspect of um, work here in Australia. So I'm speaking today on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung and Bunurung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And I also acknowledge the unceded lands of the Turrbal, Jagara and Yogara peoples, where much of the work I'm sharing with you today took place. And I pay my respects to elders past and present of these lands and acknowledge that they have always been sites of learning and creativity. So inefficient mapping um, is a practice for charting and inscribing the world and it's uh, a creative practice and it's something I developed um, as a research method for projects using post and speculative theories. And I guess that's the most important thing to think about here is the, uh, the reason why uh, I developed it um, and the need that I kind of saw uh, that we needed to have in these kind of post speculative, uh, speculative types of projects. Oh, there we go. So um, here are some examples of some of the mappings that I've um, produced in other projects. Um, and uh, you can see here that I work on different materials um, and with different types of contexts. Um, but they all um, are kind of using this inefficient mapping in some form. Um, I predominantly work in uh, flat media. So here is textile and the other one is uh, drawn um, process. Um, they're not generally three dimensional. So they, they kind of do real maps in the sense that they are usually flat objects. Um, I've worked uh, the, some of the examples I've shown are, are works that I've produced, but I've also done this form of mapping with children. Um, and this is a project that I was involved with, with children in Australia and in New Zealand. That was a um, combination of mapping and uh, creative movement. Um, and this is being, uh, I'm writing this up into another book at the moment, which is about um, post-human concepts of children's civics and um, uh, citizenship. So if you want to hear more about the technique, um, this is a screen grab of some videos I've got on Vimeo and uh, I'll, there's obviously there's time, it's not that long at the moment. So um, there's more time that you can kind of um, think about the process and the, um, the approaches to inefficient mapping if you go and have a look at these uh, resources. And I also have a website as well if you search on my name. So, um, Essentially though, it's a non-representational method for charting different physical and metaphysical components of place through the use of um, hand rendered or digital techniques. Um, the drawn mappings um, that you can see here are often created um, and then layered. Uh, I use a, a mapping film and uh, I layer them in random ways so they become quite chaotic and orient you to very different things than in a schematic topographic map that you might um, see on a classroom wall or buy in a shop, for example. 
And so inefficient mapping tunes into the distributed energies and affects of things in phenomena and is a counter mapping to read place through dominant values that centralize particular subjects and politics. And my approach to mapping not only connects methodologically to imminent and speculative theories, it is a conscious effort to develop a critical research practice built on resistance and an ethics of care. So you can hear in that that it, it, the, the primary driver was a methodologic driver, uh, a processual driver. And the ethics of caring is a political gesture, not necessarily bound up in morals, but in techniques and technologies and practice that are perhaps prompted by and constructed through those politics. So methodologically, what it is that ethically care is to foreground how processes such as mapping can disrupt common theorizations about wayfinding, which position humans as navigating across land and being able to do this while treating everything as a backdrop. Ethically wayfinding can disrupt this reduction of things to a human backdrop. For example, Haudenosaunee feminist scholar Mishwana Goman researches how the practices of land-based narratives by First Nations writers establishes records of place replete with its histories and this is a vi vital wayfinding practice for maintaining spatial relationships and cultural identity. Eve Tuck and Marsha McKenzie describe how Goman's project called Remapping explores how quote indigenous women have defined indigeneity their communities and themselves through challenges to colonial spatial order especially through literary mappings end quote that navigate belongings that predate colonial classifications. Goman's project attends to decolonization through mapping and wayfinding practices based on interrelations, stories, histories, layered borderings and future decolonial possibilities. Stephanie Springay and Sarah E. Truman form Walking Lab, um, a research-based art project that undertakes walks as propositional practice for generating relations in the world. In stone walks, Springay and Truman walked to, between and among rocks as a way of interrogating the usual ways rocks are positioned and to consider how inhuman amnesty helps us to quote, learn with the world rather than about it, end quote. In these wayfinding examples, the politics of human exceptionalism, race, feminism, colonization, industrialization and capitalism become effective registers through which imminent and speculative theories are interpreted and how phenomena are read and mapped. Similarly, inefficient mapping activates a transformative ethics through a technologic, speculative and imminent exploration of spaces and sites. Critically and theoretically informed methods should ethically expose the detailed extent of ongoing relationalities in the world. And the projects by Goman and by Springay and Truman exemplify how feminist scholarship is thinking differently about the ethics of encounter. These wayfinding practices emphasize our subjectivity and politics and that we research through affective and relational ethics. Likewise, Inefficiently mapping is not just a human wandering about in spaces and taking notice of things to draw. It thinks differently about the ethics of the encounter and keeps that central. Foregrounding a political ethics means that inefficient mappings do not use conventional navigational wayfinding tactics, even though they are non-representational wayfinding documents for the cartographer or researcher. The mappings connect to meaningful areas and aspects of the place by recording connection points from the multitude of activities occurring. This effective imminent reading generates ethical um, locational routes through and across place to generate mappings that have a countering wayfinding capacity. And the mappings seek out alternate geanal I knew I'd struggle on this word, genealogies that subvert common histories told through a privileged white masculine narrator. Inefficient mapping should be understood as a cartography rather than a conventional map. 
and thinking of inefficient mapping as a cartographic practice, away from a focus on the production of the dead object, the map, and onto this lively action, which is the practice of mapping, opens up critical thinking about the ways land and space become figuratively, literally, and physically recorded and shaped for and by capital, um, manufacture, development, and geocorporatization. So this image uh, of the Immigration Museum in um, Melbourne, Australia, provides an example of a counter mapping of Australian history. It's a Saturday and the museum is full of people attending a whole day cultural diversity event targeted um, at celebrating multi-generational, multi-perspectival ways of belonging. Rooms throughout the building are filled with museum displays, seminars, live music and um, uh, activities run by local cultural groups. I'm at the museum to attend the event. However, the mapping I make is of the building rather than the people. The Immigration Museum in Melbourne opened in 1998 in the building that was Old Customs House. In Australia, Customs Houses were erected by British colonisers to regulate trade and immigration. The regulation of trade generated a lot of income for the government before the introduction of income tax. However, the regulation of immigration was designed specifically to uh, enact the notorious white Australia policy. And this was a policy that openly prevented anyone of non-white, non-English speaking background from entering Australia. Iterations of the policy continued to have a presence in Australian immigration laws until the 1970s. Now this backstory is important because it offers some indication of the multitudes of things happening across scales and registers in that building and how my inefficient mapping picked out ethical locational routes through these. I mapped the chips and chinks, the small marks of wear and tear and the small damages to the surfaces of the building. By mapping the damaging inflictions on the building, I sought to subvert the associations of power linked to colonial buildings and attend instead to the politics, histories and reclaiming of the space by the public programmes and exhibitions that now take place. In its history, the building that the Immigration Museum now occupies was created to enact the violent intentions of white colonialists. Inefficiently mapping the tiny marks of damage of the wear and tear to the building caused by the many people who have moved through its rooms and mapping these during a vibrant cultural event filled with people who have historically been denied entry to Australia is a counter mapping wayfinding practice that is immersed in the politics and ethics of care. So the example shows how a cartographer might not focus on a kind of route going from A to B, but through historical, political and geologic affects and effects. These kinds of orientations attend to Catherine Yusuf's untimely dimensions of the relational and interactive things in events. The maps do not navigate space in the ways that conventional wayfinding maps do. They navigate through non-representational means, such as affects, politics, memories, etc. Counter wayfinding um, need not engage zonal linear orientations, but use affect, sensation, belonging, exclusion, culture, history, freedom, and fear. Navigation can happen variously through mental images, sequenced instructions, familiar sounds, smells, movements, and topologies. Inefficient mapping fac uh, facilitates wayfinding not by relying on the legend symbols and lines on a conventional map to help one orient across unfamiliar territory, but by being located in the place, feeling the air currents, the smells, the organisation of light, shadow, how the body feels in the space, how the body must move as it steps over the terrain. Gwilym Eads suggests that, quote, wayfaring is movement in contact with the land, air, water and biosphere in general. The wayfarer in journeying across the land is in continuous interaction with elemental features of the landscape, end quote. 
Locational familiarity enables people to navigate their way through low feature natural environments, such as a local park, forest or beach or waste ground. We walk that route many times and come to be with it and know it as part of the assemblage of, phys of physical things, energies of the body, wind, air, histories of times past and future. Familiarity activates the memory of moving the body in relation to a space that becomes feature full to us, even though it might be utterly unfamiliar and mysterious to others. This inefficient mapping was produced in a locationally familiar place, and that this familiarity prompted a modest wayfinding practice of being with phenomena across times and in ethical relation with place. Fish Creek is a waterway running through a neighborhood I once lived in. <clears throat> The suburb is named The Gap and sits in the traditional lands of the Torrible people in Queensland, Australia. Fish Creek has spiritual importance to the Torrible people and is the site of a freshwater eel dreaming story. Originally, the creek wove its way through dense old forest. However, in present day, it threads through the usual features of a predominantly white middle-class suburb, housing, schools, parks, bushland, and a golf course. Walking trails flank parts of the creek that remain in park or bushland, and these are popular and well used. I was familiar with these sections of the creek and walked them regularly at different times of the year and in different weather conditions. I became familiar not only with the topology of these stretches, but with the occurrences of things and beings there, and also the histories and significance of the site. Now this ethical familiarity translates into mappings I completed while walking with the creek and while I noted small aspects of the movement of things going on. And these mappings are wayfinding documents for me. When I look at this image, I can recall where I walked, where I stopped, and I have mental images of these, including me being there and making these mappings. So ethical wayfinding and being with place is very different to colonial practices of impartially or objectively charting unfamiliar land, where the cartographer might see themselves as placed on top of the ground, centrally positioned as the key activator of the landscape, which performs a backdrop. Indigenous scholarship is vital in dislodging the dominance of this view and for understanding complex interrelationalities between locations, country, identity, and the ethical ways of navigating through these. And Goman's remapping project serves as an important methodological example of how wayfinding across land rich with different associative histories and cultures, relationships, organizations, and pathways can take place. <coughs> And this means that ethical wayfinding is not only about charting alternate pathways or topologies, it's about taking the responsibility for the ability to respond while being mindful of privilege, subjectivity and the contributions we make to the politics of the world. So with this in mind, um, because of time being quite short, I've um, scripted some provocations and I'm going to read through these questions uh, and extend on them a little bit. But what I'd like you to do is to write these down. Um, and after today, after this session, um, to locate yourself somewhere that you're able to be. I know that there are people um, attending here from all parts of the world and in different kind of um, states of enclosure uh, and lockdown. So it, it may be that you can only go to your window or it might be that you can go to the edge of your garden or you may be able to walk around um, but I'd like you to kind of go to a place and to um, use these provocations to think about how you might um, ethically um, and inefficiently map that space to think about wayfaring and wayfinding in these ethical ways. So the first one is how do I practice inefficient mapping and um, if you want to um, write that first one down, an extension of that is it's easiest to use drawing materials. These can be digital though. Sharpen your eyes to look at small details and practice trying to trace partial, partial aspects of these details with your eyes. If you're mapping movement, 
in you know in the scene that you are that you have in front of you your eyes and hands will need to move quickly it's advisable to hold your drawing tool in an uncommon way to make your hand and arm more connected to your brain and eyes and i tend to use what's called a, in education a fist grip which is like this so it's totally different to the way I would hold my pencil when I'm writing. And it, it actually makes me think differently by holding the tool differently in an uncommon way. And it's best not to look at the paper until you are finished. And this is because your focus is on tracing partial aspects of small details. You're not producing a drawing. You should not have any kind of representational imagery. If you draw on tracing film, as I do, you can stack the mappings afterwards and see what happens to those images. Second question is, how do I go about counter wayfaring? Select a location you can access. It might be a place where you have been before, so you might know how to navigate it, or it might be a place you've never been to. Irrespective, Take time to research it and know it through information that goes well beyond the specifics of your particular research topic or your prior knowledge. Cultural, historical, political, colonial, indigenous, environmental information is important because it extends on how a location becomes ethically more familiar. The wayfinding in this case is not determined by conventional directional maps but by acknowledging and noting that sites have rich histories, significances and associations. Question three is what does it feel like to counter wayfind? The place feels familiar and new at the same time. The familiarity comes not only from your prior experiences, however, familiarity comes from time spent coming to know the place. Thinking about how knowledge might build via a combination of historical, cultural, political, environmental information and how that orients you in particular ways to that place. Having this information should bring about a careful navigation through place and the information should remain foregrounded as you create mappings. For example, there might be a site of cultural or historical significance in the place and this might become a key navigational point. Question four, how do I know that I've finished a mapping? The mappings might concentrate on making scratches and marks of aspects that have ethical significance and more than one navigational point might be included. There's no single defined assertion of when an inefficient mapping is finished as this idea of stasis works against the imminent and speculative theories informing that methodological approach. And finally, how do I look for a navigational route through in a finished inefficient mapping? The combination of physically being in a place, researching about a place and walking through it and mapping bring about a residing geontologic learning that resurfaces for you when mappings are looked at um, after you've created them. The mappings are often abstract to others, uh, which contests the usual um, uh, communicative um, uh, requirements of a map. But they, these maps affect powerful reminders of wayfinding routes to those who created the mappings. And that's it. I'm just going to stop share. Well, thank you so much for that, Linda. It's, uh, you know, you've covered a lot in a very um, short space of time. I don't know if covering the ground is quite the right uh, image in the light of what you've been saying, um, but you've certainly taken us on a journey and, um, you know, made us think a lot about, um, you know, how we find our way around the world. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, questions and comments um, at the end about this. Um, now, just before we go on to the next presentation, one or two people have actually uh, said that they haven't been able to see the um, the images for the presentation. Um, I don't know, Jacob, if you could just check that if there's a problem. Um, if anyone, I think one person certainly said that they couldn't see the images. If anyone else has got that problem, then please uh, go into the chat and we'll see what we, we can do about it. 
Right, so um, our second presentation, um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to, you, you might be able to see at the back there, I, I have a, um, some graphic images of some plants. And uh, uh, although I have to say that I'm, <coughs> I'm not uh, very, very kind of clued up really with, um, with, um, with this, but um, I'm very much looking forward to the next presentation. Um, which is um, the title of which is mapping urban plantiness. And, about this. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Alex, are, are you there? Are you with us? I'm here. Ah, good. Good. Good morning. Good. Good evening. <laughs> I'm sorry we didn't be able to see talk to you a bit earlier, but I'm, I'm so glad you, you could you could join us. Um, so just to briefly introduce you, um, I mean, Alex has, um, you know, has been developing her counter mapping uh, practice, um, particularly in relation to, um, to ecologies, ecological uh, issues, and this notion of a recombinant uh, e ecology. Um, and she's working, been working on a series of projects, uh, one of which is um, a planty atlas, which was, I think was published in 2019. Um, and I think she's going to be partly talking a bit about that. Um, and also another work in progress, um, the Green Square, which is an atlas of civic ecologies. So I think it's taking it in perhaps into the, into the urban, um, looking at the whole issue of the urban renewal in Sydney. Um, so uh, Alex is, uh, is based at the University of Technology in Sydney. Um, and I think she's been working with uh, Ilaria Vani, who I think probably, I don't know if she's with us or not, but uh, I think this is, a, this is a, a project, or at least some of your work has been in partnership um, with Ilaria. Ilaria, uh, Ilaria is us. here as well, and we are presenting together. As, oh, so this great. work is together as Mapping Edges. Fantastic, okay. So, so, over, so uh, Jacob, can you co-host both of them, yes? Yeah. Okay. All right, Thank Alex, you, over, to, over to you. Thank you. Um, just one second, I will just start uh, sharing. Um, my screen. Okay. Can you see this image? Yes, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so um, I would like to start, so Ali and I work together as Mapping Edges, that's the name of our research studio. And uh, like Linda, uh, I would like to start acknowledging that the Gadigal and Wongo people and all the traditional owners uh, of the Sydney Basin are indeed the traditional custodians of where we live and work. So this land was never ceded and we tread lightly, acknowledging the ongoing colonizations. And we pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And we also uh, want to commit to a lifelong long learning with Aboriginal people and from country about the interconnections between plants, country and knowledge systems. So I, my name is Ilaria Vanni. I work at the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, in the School of International Studies and Education. And, and I'm Alexander <laughs> Crosby. I work in the School of Design <coughs> at the same university. And we start this presentation with uh, uh, a question. And our question here is, how does our understanding of cultural, environmental and social histories of place change if we let ourselves be guided by plants? Um, and we are presenting to do these uh, three projects, uh, in, in <coughs> three rather different parts of uh, Sydney and they are, all, they are all in Gadigal and Wongo country. So the first one which is the one that we will present more in depth because of time constraints is uh, in this area here 
uh, known as Merrickville. The second is really in the inner city of Sydney in Altimo near the university where we work. And the third one is in uh, Green Square, which is this new uh, place of urban renewal, which is marketed as the biggest urban renewal project of Australia. And we thought of showing you this image to locate in space and scale these projects. And it is important for us to stress that we work in highly um, urbanized areas and that we work at a very small scale. And what we do is to map situated practices. So mapping edges um, relates very much to research that um, shows the importance and power of, of a small scale, of embodied and collective and vernacular propositions. So we are very much inspired by a design theorist called Roger, Roger Fr Tony Fry, um, who writes, whenever we are, that's where we start, which is exactly what we did. So our approach to plenty mapping includes walking, and walking means also gathering geographical knowledge, photo documentation and drawing, map production, which includes conceptualization of what to map, gathering and analyzing data, designing, printing and folding maps, and dissemination and sharing of these maps. And we also run participatory workshops to observe and test the maps that we produce in the wild, so to speak, so that to see what people do with our maps. And it's always quite revealing. And um, for us, this is important because by paying attention to plants, we generate visual roots that do three main things. The first one is that they foreground trajectories like settler colonialism. The second is that they re-enchant our relationship with place. And the third is that they connect us to changes in the environment, for instance, um, uh, bringing about uh, much more intimate um, relations with things like climate breakdown. So we are aware, of course, that focusing our attention on plants um, risks to forget uh, the unevenness of power embedded in the landscape and the ongoing histories of dispossessions and colonialism in the composition of the city, as well as the different histories of laborers, migrant and non-migrant that have shaped cities. So in thinking about these histories, we conceptualize the city not so much as a palimpsest of, you know, layers going back in time, but as a thrown togetherness of multiple trajectories from different times and different spaces that come together in the here and now. So a simultaneity of stories, of stories so far as Dorian Massey's would have put it. And in plant terms, what you can see in this image, for instance, is um, two images of plenty thrown togetherness in the shape of uh, uh, a native tree, this is a Port Jackson um, tree, and an olive tree, which was imported by um, migrants who came with um, migrants to um, Australia. Um, so plants in order, um, in other words, are, are our allies in uh, the mapping process. And in thinking about the cities, not simply as the result of uh, contemporary urban design and architecture, but on the contrary, we think of this city as the colonial city and the Aboriginal city coexisting. So we are not taking plants as symbols of different peoples because this is, um, you know, this is a colonial strategy really that equates Aboriginal people to nature. So we are not doing that, but what we are trying to say is that um, this city was cultivated and designed with plants for millennia, millennia by Aboriginal people before us. And I want to make an example. Um, 
what you're seeing here, for instance, is um, a real estate billboard advertising luxury living on the site of this big urban renewal in Green Square in Sydney. And uh, it advertises a luxury item for each letter of the alphabet. And here you have time. Um, but I want to draw your attention to the uh, front of the image, to the foreground, where what you can see is some grass. It's a clump of kangaroo grass, Semeda australis, a plant that grows widely across Australia, including on Gadigal land. And it produces these um, spear-shaped seeds that are activated by water, either by rain or increased humidity. And it's considered a keystone species across, across mass of, of Australia. Um, this means that it plays a critical role in maintaining the structure of ecosystems and also affects many other organisms. And also, um, it has multiple sets of chromosomes, which means that it can adapt to different conditions and it can adapt to climate change and different urban um, uh, ecosystems. We consider kangaroo grass in Donna Haraway's terms as a comp companion species um, to mark particular close and important formative relationships. And kangaroo grass, of course, owes its name to the fact that it was very, it is still very popular with kangaroos. Um, but it, it has been shown by um, Aboriginal historian Bruce Pascoe in his uh, work on notes of early explorers that it is also an important edible grain for humans in Australia and its cultivation as ancient origins. So Uncle Bruce Pascoe writes, Aboriginal people made changes to the genomes and habits of these plants simply through the continuous interference in the plants, growth cycle and selection of seeds for harvest. This process conducted over long periods of time is what scientists call domestication. This particular plant you are looking at now grows on the edge of this urban um, development uh, outside a train station. Um, and it has not been planted by council gardens, but it's there exactly because of, uh, you know, as a result of uh, this Aboriginal domestication of the plant. So we are not offering a recipe to solve the tension between ways to address perception of urban green and ways to inject critical reflection that takes into account Account of that, into account that while working in Australia and in other settler colonial countries, we need to ask how indigenous planty practices surface or are erased in the urban green project. So Aboriginal practices of care for country have been excluded from the na national greening narrative. And this exclusion corresponds to the lack of recognition of Aboriginal sovereignty which is not intended as the supreme legitimate authority over some polity, but as conceptions of country, relational sovereignty, embodied ontology of land-based practices that indigenous people have always been practicing and articulating. And I'm quoting here for an, an, a fairly new and important article about country by Porter, Hearst and Grandetti. So country is intended as the land, water, air, plants, animals, songs, thoughts, and people. And Aboriginal people have been caring for country for millennia. Kangaroo grass growing on the edge of the largest urban renewal project in Australia is the result of these practices of care and of country. So plants like kangaroo grass help us in our counter mapping project. Planty mats are able to metaphorically move observers away from that hovering position that Linda described as well, a colonial type of monarch of all I survey stands and place people back into the thick of things and let people be led by more than human gatherings that recombine in city ecologies as well as on country. 
So um, just very quickly to tell you what we do. Um, we, first of all, this methodology that we use is designed to be replicated and shared. And we walk by ourselves or with others, quite literally following plants. And this generates knowledge share, sharing during the walk so that when we walk with others, um, participants learn from each other. It's a very organic process also. Um, and also they learn to observe the way people take care of plants and design their gardens and their villages. And they're prompted to reflect on the relation between plants, history, community, and country. Uh, while we walk, we use Instagram a lot. Um, you can follow us on, with the hashtag Mapping Edges. Um, and Instagram is a way to photo document what we are doing and to share it in real time. And we also we keep track of our route. Um, with everyday uh, apps, fitness apps like Map My Walk, for instance, that record our move movement in space and time in the forms of lines, but also of little knots when we stop or cross the road or we have conversations like, oh, look, a beautiful papaya. Let's have, <laughs> you know, <laughs> let's have a closer look at it. So um, this is, for instance, uh, one of the first walks in Maryville, which is our first um, example, the project, the, our first project. And what I will do now is I will stop sharing and I will hand it over to um, Ali for um, an in-depth look at this particular project. Thank you, Alaria. Sorry, bear with me. How's that looking? Okay, so I'm going to talk through uh, three examples of projects that Alaria outlined the methodology and I'll just um, talk a bit about how we've applied them at specific sites and uh, through specific sets of maps. And the first is from a project called Marrickville Walks, which uh, really focused on recombinant ecologies or ecologies that are the result of human interactions, such as is the case with cities in settler colonial societies. And I'm sure many of you can, who live in settler colonial societies can identify with that idea of ecology um, with intervention. We argue that in order to make recombinant ecologies present as well as visible, we need a different order of maps, which is what we experimented with in this project. So the Marrickville walks followed plants, as Alaria outlined, and in this project, three plants were chosen from our scoping research that already grow abundantly in Marrickville. Papaya, banana and dragon fruit. Now, none of these plants are native to the area, rather they're plants that could attract the kind of botanical classification that is a little bit nasty, like alien, exotic, and even invasive. Papaya, as an example, is native of tropical regions of the Americas. Dragon fruit is a cactus, also native, native to the Americas, and bananas are native to tropical regions of the Indo-Malaya bioregion, as well as some parts of Northern Australia. In Marrickville, which is located in a humid subtropical climate region, these plants are poignant representatives of a recombinant ecology. They were introduced deliberately by people growing food, and these three plants now spread through cuttings exchanged by gardeners, seeds carried by wild animals, or exuberant root systems burrowing under fences. And this is the case of bananas, which are actually a grass, and we found 
burrowing under fences into parks and along train lines. So papayas, dragon fruits and bananas transform the landscape in unexpected ways. To represent this and think about this with others, uh, we made a digital map by walking, uh, as we discussed earlier, and that's the map my walk line on the bottom, the red line. And we used this as a base to produce hand-drawn maps. And then we printed those with banana, papaya, and dragon fruit marked by the keys B, P, and D. Very basic mapping technique. We then folded the map to form a pouch, which uh, contained three booklets on the three plants uh, with photos and snippets of interviews with residents and gardeners in the area about these plants. So when we're making uh, and printing these maps, we use a particular soy-based ink printing technique called the risograph printer. And for this specific project, we used a riso printer at a local community space called Front, Front Yard, which is in Marrickville. And we also began our walks there. So I mentioned the risograph because it allows us to produce material translations of walking in particular ways. For example, here by literally printing collected seeds superimposed to drawings translated from our digital map. And these translations generate a set of different affordances, which our designer helped us notice in this case. Instead of being frictionless, precise, data dense, and relying on GPS data sets to communicate, the risograph maps are uneven, imprecise, uh, even inefficient drawing from Linda's work. And because of the way soy ink permeates the paper, it has a heft and invites touch as you use it. So that material printing of the map is generally very important to us. This is the other side of the booklet, which is an essay that explains the project. And all of our maps, while the material artifact is important, can be digital versions can be downloaded at our site, at our website and reproduced. So the three map, the map with the three booklets were used to uh, hold a, a workshop uh, as, the, as part of the project. Um, and we shared the maps to help people connect to plants as we walked together. And the maps encouraged observation of plants growing on edges and prompted discussions of sociocultural histories of the area. In some cases, such as this edge here, the streets are full of edible plants, turmeric, lemongrass, Greek, Vietnamese, and Thai basil. And these plants speak of layers of migration to the suburb. We also, as we're doing this, invite participants to add their findings to the map and to Instagram, as Alaria mentioned. And at the end of a walk, we chat, share, and document the maps with participants additions. So you can see here that there's the dragon fruit, bananas and papayas that we found and then the added uh, plants that the participants have found. So the second project I'm gonna talk about is the Planty Atlas of UTS. Uh, it, it maps Ultimo, which is a small inner city around the university where we work, much different from to Marrickville. And in this project, we draw out the trajectories intersecting in the contemporary notion of an education technology precinct. So this is the location of our university, um, a technical college, and a whole lot of startups um, and a whole lot of aspirations around creative industries. Of course, we start these intersections by thinking about Gadigal, Sydney, and by creating maps, by following plants, observing developments, and conducting a local history study. In this project, we, work, we worked with our library and we designed three walks in the area, which were based loosely on permaculture principles. Um, I don't know if people know about permaculture, but we're happy to answer questions about that after perhaps it's a little bit of a tangent. Um, but the permaculture principles are design principles and here we use observation, interaction and accept feedback to guide our walks. On the first walk, we were sensing and note-taking using writing, photographing, drawing. 
And this walk helped us understand the landscape and its micro ecosystems, a landscape we thought we knew very well, but it wasn't until we uh, went over it and over it that we really started to understand its richness. And importantly, the first walk helped us understand the existing relationships between our participants and the neighbourhood. So here's an uh, image as an example of Alaria showing uh, UTS staff and, and community, a uh, community garden, Ultimo Community Garden, which is less than 10 minutes walk from our campus, but very few people know it's there. On the second walk, we focused on interaction and we focused on seeds and reconfiguring the circulation of seeds made in a, in a seed ball workshop preceding the walk. So we made hundreds of seed balls and seed balls are dumplings of clay, compost, soil and seeds, uh, often associated with guerrilla gardening and they're used by many activists and artists as ways to intervene in, in urban landscapes. And in this case, we worked with kangaroo grass parsley and pollinator friendly flower seeds. And on the third, on the second walk, sorry, we um, distributed these seed balls that we'd lovingly made by hand together in a workshop by throwing them all around the city or indeed carefully placing them on verges or under trees. And here's an image of flinging the seed balls along this light rail track. Um, to try and reach hard to, to, uh, hard to get to mounds of soil, which might indeed create a, a nurturing habitat for plants. So walking, mapping and seed balling like this, uh, we, we understand as micro maneuvers within top down urban systems, uh, urban planning and design. And we use them partly because they can work, but partly to draw attention to the edges of human habitat and where the trajectories of plants are always present, but often go unnoticed. So on the third walk, which was titled Accept Feedback, we retraced our steps to document the evolution and disappearance of the seed balls, the success and the fail failure of seeds we scattered. This was a sobering walk it followed the hottest Sydney summer on record, an extended period of drought, um, a season of bushfires, and very few success stories in terms of our seed balling. This is one of the only uh, plants that resulted from our, our beautiful seed balls, our little parsley plant growing on a verge. Um, but these, these failures, so to speak, were also very important in terms of what Alaria discussed in embodying and understanding very intimately the effects of climate breakdown in our local environment. The Plantia Atlas also generated a map, and this is, this is, these are some images of our Plantia Atlas map. While some streets and building names are marked on the map, and it is indeed semi-functional, its main purpose is to propose an orientation that's more plant-led than cartographic. It's also printed on the risograph, and it's also available for download at our site. So um, please feel free to have a closer look. I just pulled out this detail of the map as a demonstration of um, how we, we pulled focus. And this is, uh, there's a, a row of London plane trees along Harris Street, which is the main street that uh, divides our campus. And plane trees are a visible and sensory reminder for many like me of hay fever season. Um, but they're also a reminder of colonial human plant relations that continue to design Sydney. Plane trees are also an important canopy tree for urban cooling in Sydney. Like most cities, we are desperate for large trees as the city gets hotter. They were brought to me to help it look and feel like London or Paris. Plantaneous Orientalis is indigenous to Persia, but once it was located in Australia, it became a symbol of European civilization and now still lines the streets of Ultimo and dictates how we interact with that suburb and what other plants survive there. 
We also made a special edition book in this project, which is held in the library collection and it shares the stories of the three walks and it helps staff and students imagine a preferred planty campus. The last project, which I'll, I'll whip through quite quickly, is called the Green Square Atlas of Civic Ecologies. And we're in the middle of this project, so it's a little bit um, challenging to talk about uh, such a work in progress. But generally it's about amplifying individual collective or organisational initiatives within this area called Green Square that bring together care for place, care for country and care for the environment. So we're calling these uh, civic ecologies, these practices. And Green Square is a fascinating suburb. Well, it's an amalgamation of existing suburbs. It's not really a suburb. It's a um, urban renewal concept. Uh, it was industrial sites, canals, residential areas sort of mushed up into this single, single placemaking initiative now. Um, so we're drawing on a lot of uh, previous maps to understand that, and here's just a few of those. But just to give you a sense, a common response when we tell people, um, other colleagues, designers, geographers, uh, cultural studies colleagues, that we're working in Green Square, often we get responses like, but there's nothing there, or Green Square is just a huge construction site. So for Sydney siders, for the people who don't live there, it's often a place that's avoided, or um, the imaginary is that it's not very interesting, that it's so over-designed and over-made. Um, of course, that's not the case. Um, and in our current research phase, we're walking and observing and, and learning about all the layers that are underneath that preconception. So this is one of our events, which we started out with to engage community in the process. process. It's a seed exchanging and seed saving event with our, at our, with our partner, which is a community centre. Um, and just starting to open up discussions about plants and, and how they might exist in Green Square with people now in the past and as Green Square develops through the urban renewal process. So as part of this project, we're also developing a, a collaborative database. And um, because we have a commitment to community engagement and because it's an interesting uh, way to collect data, we're using participatory mapping. And there's such complex uh, trajectories to make sense of, but we've gone with Google online maps um, in this stage of the research. We know it's an example of a, ubiquitous urban map. It's de designed for efficiency and speed. So it, in some ways, using this tool um, creates a real tension with those notions of inefficiency that Linda raised. Um, because of course, Google Maps prioritizes the information that facilitates us getting from A to B to destinations more quickly. So as has been discussed already, maps like this can render recombinant ecologies, civic ecologies, and indeed country invisible because, they're obs because these are obstacles to the efficiencies. It's not only that which is one of the issues, but also they guide us to take particular paths. They train our eyes in particular ways with a kind of selective gaze that ignores everything um, than the t uh, beyond the task at hand. So with all that in mind, we're doing our best to redirect uh, Google Maps and help us use it to help us notice, document, analyze grassroots initiatives in a place that's very disturbed by immense scale, immense scale top-down development. Um, so this is a map of what's starting to emerge in our scoping research so far. Um, the civic ecologies that we have noticed, but also that others have pointed out to us. And we'd like to uh, move on to a activity now to wrap up our discussion of our own projects there. Um, and if we have time to just before Alice's uh, presentation to just pause and just do a quick activity with four steps. Um, which goes like this. If you're in Australia, whose country are you on? But if you're not in Australia, what people have lived on the land, you're now sitting, standing, working or walking. So first to acknowledge 
country. Secondly, to think about the walking distance from where you are. We know that many people can't walk from your room. And um, so just think about, conceptualize what walking distance means to you. And think about what plants, planty habitats, plant people relationships you've no, noticed within that walking distance. And then we'd love you to mark that on a shared map we've made. Um, and we'd love you to uh, participate in. And I'll just pop that in the chat in a minute. And there's also a um, QR code if that's easier to do. Um, so you go to, Ilaria, can you just pop the link in the chat? Because I can't do that while I'm sharing screen, I think. Thank you. Um, yeah, so we'd love you to have a look at this map and in, identify five examples of planty relations near you. I think this is a beautiful opportunity with such a diverse audience to think about how this planty lens might apply to the place that you live or work. And um, we may indeed, Linda and Alison, Alaria and I may indeed think about ways to uh, work with that data that we're collecting together um, in, a, in an artistic counter mapping project into the future, which I'll let Alice talk about. It's a little bit more related to her work, but yeah, if we've got time for that. And um, I'd just like to say thank you so much for having us. This is our website if you'd like to follow up and mapping edges as a hashtag really is an experiment in um, collective social media practice. So please feel free to use that and own that and um, distribute observations in whatever way you, you see fit. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, um, Alex and Ilaria. Um, I hope people will, will take up their suggestion and um, uh, you know contribute to the um, <clears throat> to the the map. Uh, I think you've got the um, the link on the in the chat there. So um, yeah. So please do follow that up. And also, of course, Linda's uh, um, suggestion also. So it's really important. I think people you know, actually. It's all about participatory mapping. So, you know, that's what Living Maps is about. So, you know, we want people to kind of uh, follow through on these things. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, those presentations have raised a lot of issues that we will, again, we will be discussing. So please, if you have, have uh, questions, um, please do start putting them in the, in the chat now. So, so, you know, we can, we can assemble them uh, for the, the discussion at the end. Um, Right, so our, our third uh, final presentation is from Alice Longley, um, and her title is Mapping the Aesthetic Dimensions of Power. Um, in case you thought power didn't have any aesthetic dimension, apart from ugliness, but anyway. Um, so Alice has been working um, with a, a number of colleagues, um, developing a, an art project um, which is, is entitled Mapping Porous Borders. Um, and she, I think this has been going on, I think, since 2017. Um, and it involves a, a partnership, a collaboration between uh, Eotera in New Zealand and in Chile. Uh, and I think there means a number of artists working on this uh, with using installations, performance, drawing. Um, so it's a multimedia uh, uh, project. Um, and uh, I think there's also a, a, another, I think there's another project which you Nero know, will tell us about um, uh, called New Wine Together, which is a body of artistic maps made during the pandemic by artists around the globe. Um, and again, that's something that Living Maps is very interested in. So I'm really looking forward um, uh, to her presentation. She's um, as, as you can tell from the projects, an interdisciplinary artist um, uh, and researcher, and uh, she's been working for, you know, quite a long time, 20 years, um, uh, in creating live performances, uh, making artist books, installations, and so on. So, um, Alice, if you're there, it's over to you. Here I am. <laughs> um... 
ko rangi toto toka manga, ko kai patiki toku awa, ko kai patiki toku kainga, ko Alice Longley um, toku ingawa. My name is Alice Longley. I'm uh, Rangi Toto is the mountain that I am near. Kaipataki is the river that um, uh, intersects with my life closely. Um, Kaipataki in Birkdale is the place that I'm in. Uh, I'm in Aotearoa on the north shore of Auckland right now. It's wonderful to be here and thank you for the introduction, Phil, and um, for the curation of the panel, Linda. Um, we're always unfolded with the maps that hold us, the maps that include us in or exclude us from their boundaries, their borders. Um, the maps that pull us away from or take us toward. We could see a map as a device to prevent loss. Loss can come in endless and myriad ways. <laughs> we lose our direction, our memory, our perspective. We lose objects, names, and histories. Perhaps there are as many forms of map as there are forms of loss in our collective exper experience. Um, and I wrote that for the introduction of the book, um, Artistic Approaches to Cultural Mapping. And today I'm really thinking about the orientation of maps as a way to hold processes of care connection and understanding across borders and nation states. If we think of the map as a device to prevent loss, um, I think about the risks that we're collectively facing at the moment. And from here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, where our borders have been closed for over a year. And I think of those of us living it with lockdown, we think of the risks that come from isolationism, um, the increase of kind of nationalism that I notice with closed borders, um, the difficulties of collaborating and connecting digitally, um, these things that kind of get us to separate, how can we demand and find new ways of mapping our worlds in order to find new ways to dwell together in these times to meet these risks? So I'm really super uber pleased <laughs> to be here at this gathering today with you all. Um, which brings us together from across the world and enables me to cross my borders here a little bit out to you. Um, it was really beautiful to see in the chat just how representative we are as a group from different parts of the world. Um, and I think that these moments of border crossing are really, really precious. Um, so I'm wondering what an artistic map is. Oh, hold on. I'm just... Oh, there we go. Um, what are its limits? When does it cease being a map and become an artwork more generally? Is its status as an artistic map determined more by the process that um, underpins it or by the form or the materiality that it takes? So for me, artistic maps are 100% about a process um, and the form that I think artistic maps take has to be utterly open. So here's a few little forms I'll play. O sangue nessuno di noi si accosta che ti stava divorando finché fu troppo tardi. Sei semplicemente scomparso, un altro, in un altro luogo, riterritorializzato. Can I present you with a new touch? Just the gravity of a touch. Just the gravity. Just, just, just now. And I'll talk a little bit more about these maps a bit later on. Um, but more, just more generally, I'm personally at the moment really interested in um, 
thinking about mapping intangible things, mapping affect, and poetic mapping. And I think this aligns really well with the discussions we've had with um, Linda and Ilaria and Alex, um, thinking less about efficiency and more about um, attention and the moment and experience and sensation, embodied experience. Um, today I'm gonna to talk about artistic maps in a few ways, as devices to prevent loss, as scores for future movement, as things to imagine worlds yet to come, as enabling contact when borders are closed and physical touch is very difficult, um, as a means to challenge the idea that geopolitical paradigms are set or concrete, and as holding strategies for decolonizing. So it might be arguable over whether the next, um, what I will call an artistic map, you might consider an artistic map. Um, and I think that question of the edges is a really interesting one. So this map comes in the form of a performance. Um, the project Mapio de Bords Porosos, Mapping Porous Borders, was created um, in 2018 as a collaboration between myself and Chilean artists Macarena Campbell Parra and Maximo Corvalan Pincheda. Um, Maka is a dance artist and Max is a visual artist. Um, and the three of us, as you mentioned, Phil, have been working together since 2017, and we've made every year, we've made new work together um, every year since 2017. So 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21, and we'll be, I think our project will continue into next year. Um, So I'm going to show you a work that's showed in two places. It's showed in the Museum of Memory and Human Rights in Santiago. And it's showed um, at Waipapa Marae and at the Old Folks Hall in um, Tamaki Makoto, Auckland. Um, the project that brought us together kind of followed these principles of um, porous boundaries between creative disciplines, um, connecting across Pacific ontologies, questioning the idea of the nation state, um, looking at flows of decolonizing practices really oriented um, across the Pacific Ocean, um, working with creative experiments, critical discussions and um, tactics for decolonizing, working with resistance um, and resistances that open up space for imagining, looking at spaces of translation and mistranslation, misunderstanding and imperfect <laughs> um, movement of ideas um, as a creative strategy. So when we don't understand something, that is a point of movement. Um, thinking about art as a practice of imaginative space making and moving across disciplinary boundaries. Okay, and I'll show you the little map, um, Mapping Porous Borders. Is that showing okay? E rārangi i wainga i te wai i te kiri, e rārangi i wainga tau tinana i taku hoki, e rārangi e wainga i ngā motumaha, e rārangi i wainga i te korokunga punga i te ātiri. La línea entre el tiempo de tu cuerpo y el tiempo de mi cuerpo. La línea entre estados nacionales. La línea entre la pureza y resistencia. La línea entre el migrante y el refugiado. La línea entre el primer mundo y el tercer mundo. La línea entre la hierba y la planta. La línea entre el norte global y el sur global. La línea entre bienvenida y rechazo. La línea entre propiedad y posesiones compartidas entre la marea y el mar. El ando un océano de piel hecho de distancia. La línea entre el primer mundo y el tercer mundo. The line between weed and plant. The line between the global north and the global south. The line between welcome and rejection. The line between ownership and some shared possession. The line between the entire world. 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 So since our project began in 2017, right up till now, the map has really acted as a central pivot to hold 
This research and our performance ideas across languages, cultures, distances, time zones, and worlds. Um, so I'm thinking about world making, how exclusions and inclusions will always be present. I think it's so important that we hold space to produce radical, critical maps that are vigilant about attending to the movement of power and the connections and disconnections being forged at given moments. And I think about that now in terms of this pandemic and um, the power grabs that are happening in terms of um, politics and spaces and geopolitics and how artists have a role in drawing attention to some of that movement. So Max's work is a great inspiration for me. He's worked into such spaces over the last couple of decades. And it was in, when I saw Maximo Cordovalam Tinchata's work, um, when we were in a sh group show together at, um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art Santiago in 2017, I was super moved by the way that he creates very specific methodologies at, in order to attend, of artistic mapping in order to attend to really particular geopolitical situations. Um, and it was through sharing our work that we could understand each other because Max speaks Spanish and I speak English. So we don't really, we haven't had a common language, but it's been growing the longer we've been work, working together. Um, but really it was through seeing our, this work that I jumped at the chance for us to keep working together and we've managed to do that. So I wanted to share some of the ways that Max has developed some methods. Um, so in the Mapio de Bos Porosos video, you can see that we're working inside a projection of his work, um, Costa Seca, Dry Coast, which shows aerial images of a territory being drawn on a landscape. And we'll just go to Max's website. Hmm. Here it is. Um, So in the Costa Seca work, um, you can see Max is marking out this landscape. Um, in the essay from Earth Rise to Google Earth, The Vanishing of a Vanishing Point, Tracy Valcourt and Sebastian Picard discuss the perspective gained by aerial images as a means for creating sensible things out of abstract ideas which have a dual existence as being something and standing in for something. Aerial maps go about teaching us new ways of seeing that expose the invisible infrastructures of power that underpin the everyday. Exposing the invisible infrastructures of power that underpin the everyday. And so in this work, Costa Seca, Max is literally delineating national boundaries along a patch of coastline whose ownership was disputed in a quite intense and drawn out political dispute between Peru and Chile over many years. Um, so he's drawing the disputed territory with a road marker in the sand of salt. The futility of marking a fixed boundary on a world that exists through its movement is articulated in this artistic map that catches at once the connecting fluid majesty of landscape and the smallness of proprietorial thinking. We see how the space is in constant flux, which gives us rise to wonder about the appropriateness of labeling an oceanic space in terms of this or that nation state. And I think we see the beauty of the landscape and you realize, you know, to get into such an intense diplomatic dispute that may have involved militarization, the ridiculousness of those actions um, becomes clear, I think, when you can see the work from this perspective, see the, the space from this perspective. Such artistic practice enables juxtaposition of the abstract and the actual, opening space for questioning and a recalibration of perspective. Paul Carter's essay, Shadowing Passage, reflects on the importance of poetics flux and rhythm in artistic mapping to perceive places as compositions and maps as spores for future movement. And I look at Max's map and I really do think of it as a kind of score for future movement and that it's a provocation. It incites us to question how we understand ownership of territory, how we think about ecology and space 
and how we can really critically question the invention and application of the nation state. In that, the work is intensely political while also capturing the wild formal intensity of the sea. Okay, so now I'd like to share. Um, this is another one of Max's work that we've worked in called Trompo sobre Korea, um, spinning tops over Korea, where conventional maps become board games. By turning the writing of maps into a participatory game, Max highlights the arbitrary nature of border creation and migration patterns as games of chance that affect the lives of millions of people often with devastating consequences. So his works build up relational mapping interact and with interaction with his um, audiences to make these kind of overlaid maps. But also, oh, sorry. Um, mapping can also be a way of inciting hope and possibility challenging the idea that maps and geopolitical paradigms are set or concrete. After our performance in Auckland, Maka asked Max and I to each write a paragraph reflecting on our experience in the project. And Max came back to us with his paragraph in the form of a map. And I'll just read you a little part of it. Um, we try these lines and drawings, these rules and attempts. Why not think the world upside down to cross significant borders with significant results in the flesh today? rewriting our stories, our maps, trying to loose those lines that were written from violence, enunciate them and open them to other bodies and other passages of gesture. Um, and I, I really continue to find that line, um, trying to loosen those lines that were written with, from violence, um, moving and powerful, especially after having worked. So we wrote this in 2018. Um, but then in 2019, we experienced the Chilean Movimiento Social, the Chilean social uprising. Um, and I was in Santiago working with Max and Maka. At, uh, we were working together on the day that the outbreak happened. Um, and so that really brought into another kind of intensity how the issue of how to continue across time and space when we, could, we stopped being able to move across the city and work together because we literally couldn't cross the city in the wake of the intense protests. Um, it was a state of emergency and it really brought into question how we understand ourselves as simultaneously collective and singular. And witnessing the vital role of art in the Chilean social movement has really intensified my belief in the necessity of artistic practice in times of change and civil emergency. And I, I just say that for me, being in Santiago during that time really gave me a new perspective when COVID hit because we'd already experienced a kind of lockdown experience. Um, and it made me think a lot about the dif different kinds of safety and risk that we live in, political, social, um, bacterial. Um, but then again, when, the, and I could talk more about this, I could talk about this experience for ages, but I'll move on and talk about our current project. Um, when COVID hit and the globe was forced into lockdown, Max and I became, um, began a new pro project at, um, through Zoom meetings. And this project is Beberemos el Vino Nuevo Juntos, um, Let Us Drink the New Wine Together. So we'll have a quick look um, at this project. Um, yeah, the aim of our project is contact contact with other artists in different parts of the world. So we've developed a series of relational artworks that are designed to incite collaboration and touch when the borders are closed. How can we touch each other? How can we connect with each other? And how can we collaborate um, together are the questions that um, Max and I were looking at. And so we've worked with, I don't know, well over 70 or 80 artists in all continents of the world. Um, to co-create a series of artworks in digital form and analog form. Um, so the digital project involved sharing, sending this base map around to many artists um, 
who created interventions and then sent them back to us as Photoshop layers to be developed for a museum work. We've been working towards a museum work um, at the Museum of Contemporary Art Santiago. Um, but our first iteration will be a project that Linda's leading in Melbourne later this year. So this is Paul Hughes's map. Um, he was looking at embroidery of wounds. Um, Linda's map, some inefficient mapping. Perhaps Oscar Farfan from Mexico. So you'll see these again um, at the end in our workshop. Um, the second part of the project looks at envelopes as a circulatory system. So we've been creating these. Um, this is my partner, Jeffrey Holdaway, and he created some watercolor paintings. So each, each envelope is a bespoke art object. And the envelopes travel around the world with miniature artworks in them. And each artist who receives them is asked to take something they'd like to keep and to add something in. So it's kind of your basic pen pal <laughs> chain, um, chain letter set up. It's not a new methodology, but it's been really exciting in this time of COVID to be able to cross the borders when our bodies can't do it and our artworks can in this small way. Some of the artworks have taken up to seven or eight months to arrive. So it was really amazing when um, the Canary Islands received the envelope and then sent it to France. And that took like nine months, New Zealand, Canary Islands, Chile, I mean, to France, which might usually have taken, I don't know, two weeks, seven to eight months was the COVID lag. Um, so we're insisting on the possibility of touching beyond our borders, uh, borders in the absence of permission to do so. Um, and we've worked in all continents from Australia to Africa, South America, Europe, Asia, North America. And then, then we see the exhibition as a place where ideas can touch and be carried away. So there's the paintings. Um, this is what the envelopes look like. And you see this space so that the artist crosses out their own name and adds the name of the next artist onto the envelope. So at the end, you have this accumulation. Oh, um, so our project has also involved, I've just recorded our meetings as we've met. Um, so regular conversations between these two artists between Aotearoa and Chile, we're not fluent in each other's languages. Um, and we've created an archive of mistranslations and imperfect communications. And I thought this little video shows from the beginning of the project sort of shows that value. But if it gets lost, we have another thing and we can document the process. Yes. It is about the attempt rather than the attempt knowing that it is precarious. Mm, no, entendi. I don't understand that. Okay, I think I will do this. And, so we, um, we made good use of Google Translate. So um, I'm writing into the into the Google Translate chat. <laughs> um, it's the attempt that matters. Maybe something gets lost, or maybe we expect something to get lost in the post, but we document the process. So the intention is yes. the important part. If we try a few things, some will work and some will fail. And that is interesting. So always the project has been more mm -hmm. about attempt than it has been about um, achievement or knowing knowing what's going to happen. It's a very precarious project in a precarious time. However, we've had some wins. So um, three of four of the envelopes have now made it from me in New Zealand through three other artists in three other um, countries to Max in Chile. So out of we've sent 16. And so far, we've had four arrive in Chile and many others are safe in many other parts of the world. Um, Yes. It's really beautiful. <laughs> we did it. We managed to make three envelopes across the world. Look at that. Look at that, Jeffrey. Okay. Look at that, Jeffrey. Oh wow. It this is only this is really beautiful. <laughs> Um, and I think what's beautiful is the tracing of the connection 
it's the postmarks, it's the handwriting, it's the adaptation to the envelopes that make it beautiful as a work. Um, the touch, the shared touches that create the work. And just to let you know, there's a protocol so that when the envelope arrives in your house, you put it in a safe space and then you wash your hands for 20 seconds. You don't touch it for two days. And then so that the envelope rests, which allows it to be safe. So we've really been making sure that there's safety precautions at this time. Um, just another couple of um, things we've been working on. We've been working with Maka campbell Pada to develop a performative version of the work, which involves sending a book of creative provocations. And I was thinking about the creative provocations that we've had from Linda and Alex and Ilaria today. So we've also been working with those. Um, based on the idea of using cardboard as an accessible, humble, equalizing skin. Um, and so people can work both locally and digitally with our little guidebook called Language is an Intangible Bridge. And this is one of the provocation pages that Maka and her team, Rolando Hara and Eduardo Serontaliera created um, for us. But I'm gonna move straight on to the final part of the project. Um, which is the digital part of the project. So if we can't have a museum installation, we'll have a digital collaboration. And today we'd like to invite you to be our first ever test audience on our um, digital project. Uh, we've been working with Dot Dot, who um, are a, di a digital design studio who are based in New York, Kate Stevenson and Chris White. And we've been translating the maps from our project to create socially immersive, interactive digital worlds. Um, dot dot work between digital gaming, art museum installation, film and immersive technology. Um, so we're creating the project as a digital site where visitors can meet together from anywhere in the world and spend time together inside the artworks. Um, so I'm just gonna copy the URL in and you guys can all go in and experience the artwork just for five minutes, the digital platform. Um, just a note is that we're still prototyping. So we think, um, so this is an attempt today. It's an attempt <laughs> uh, and it's a test. And we imagine that we'll be iterating on the site for the next year or more, um, opening it up in partnership with different live um, events or online events. Um, so we have about five minutes to explore the digital world. Um, I'll just demonstrate how to enter it. Um, I do encourage you, if you have them, I took my headphones off, but I think it's best to have headphones because you're gonna be able to talk to each other inside the world. And so that way you'll have less um, sound issues. Um, so I'm just going to, the, the browser that's best for it is um, Chrome. I'm using Firefox, but um, I'm gonna, I'll put the URL in the Zoom chat in a moment. But first of all, I'll just demonstrate it for you. Um, so you need to take the URL, put it in your browser, and then you'll just go straight there. Ta-da! Um, so you need to start your camera and allow. Now we are staying, we're gonna ask you to stay in the Zoom, um, but open up a new tab in your browser. Um, and some people might have computers that this is a problem with, in which case they can just follow along with me and other people will be able to go into the world for themselves and negotiate it. The world is a series of um, maps that e each, room has its own portal. So your job is to find the portals um, and you'll be together. So you can talk to each other to find the portals and go from one map into the other. So when you enter as a guest, you just need to write in, you can write whatever you want, just whatever, um, put whatever you want in these boxes. And then you enter. So you'll find yourself, um, and we start off with the envelope project and then, you, hi, Chris, how's it going? <laughs> um, so Chris and I can see each other. Chris is from Dot Dot, so Chris can help you if you get stuck. Um, we also have Elizabeth and Kate who'll show up in the world. Um, so the first portal, just to give it away, you have to post yourself. <laughs> um, 
And there's Kate. Hi, Kate. <laughs> um, uh, and then, yes, we'll go one more. And then the rest you'll have to figure out when you go in. There we go. Um, so we, you'll go together and the rooms have about eight people per room, so then they replicate. So there'll be about eight of you in a room together. Okay, I'm going to come out of this because the sound is a bit confusing. Um, does that sound okay to everyone? I'm going to put the URL in the chat right now. So if you go to the end of the chat, So if you just, um, yeah, copy and paste, or you might just be able to click on the URL, but if you um, copy it into Chrome. And then I will share screen again. Um, Kate and Chris, are you there? Do you have any further points about um, anything to think about? Um, no, that sounds good to get started. We look forward to meeting you inside. Feel free to, to let us know if you do have any questions, though, in the chat. Yeah, and again, just make sure that your microphone is muted on Zoom, which I know it is already, <laughs> but just saying, because otherwise we'll get some feedback, so. Um, so I'm going to go back into the, I'm going to share screen again for those of you that have any problems. Um, just sometimes having Zoom up. And, oh, we do invite you to... Um, Copy the URL and then after today, like if you have problems with it while you're on Zoom, you can try it after we close the Zoom and have a go. Kate and I, I will hang out in the world. So um, it might be easier if you have any problems to do it after um, because of some computers have the glitch having two microphone camera things happening at the same time. So for those of you, we're going to start our five minutes now and come back um, in five. Um, for those of you that are having any issues, here we are. Um, I'm going back in again. I just find it easier to do one thing at a time. Um, Um, so to finish, I'd just like to return to this concern with artistic ma mapping as a means to facilitate contact, contact with artists from different parts of the world. And we're looking forward to curating events um, this year through our digital site where we can gather people together in real time to journey through the maps and hopefully to find delight and surprise and a sense of being together in worlds yet to come. And that's me. Wow, <laughs> all I can say is, wow, that's just a fantastic, I think it's the most interesting, <clears throat> intricate and beautiful, you know, demonstration of what digital, participatory forms of digital mapping can do. I mean, just taking <laughs> mapping somewhere else, basically, which I think is fantastic. Um, the, the problem we now have is that really, since we've, we've run out of time, I mean, we have about five or six minutes, um, we scheduled to uh, finish at, at eight o'clock, um, uh, which doesn't really give us, you know, any time at all, really, to to do justice to the richness of the the three uh, presentations that we've seen this evening. Um, I mean, I hope people will um, take up the suggestions to follow through 
uh, I think each of the presenters has suggested ways in which you can do that so that uh, that conversation can in a sense can can continue um, with the, with the presenters um, maybe as it's just there's just maybe five minutes, I've just maybe just put one question to all of you uh, which, which occurred to me obviously there are some fascinating um, you know connections uh, you know between your your bodies of work um, although they're also each of them you know very distinctive in their own way and their focus and their and their form but I mean you obviously share a set of common preoccupations so um, first question is really is, is, is to what extent you know your work has come out of this kind of collaborative um, partnership and and where you see that going um, and the second one is, is more about the context of it um, it seems to me all of your work in different ways relates to the issue of indigenous cartographies and indeed indigenous ecologies um, and I just wonder about the terms and conditions of that relationship I mean whether it's one of coexistence or translation um, or tension um, and obviously I'm sure this is something which you've you think about and you think through in your practice. So I think it just might be interesting to hear uh, briefly, unfortunately, from each of you. Um, first of all, on, on the sort of the elements of you know the, of, of partnership and collaborative work, and in, at a time when we're all kind of you know, as, as the last project showed, you know, rather isolated, and how we can actually uh, overcome that. Uh, and then secondly, this issue of the relationship to indigenous cartographies and ecologies. So I don't know, Linda, would you like to? Sure. Well, I can answer the first question quite easily. We have a, um, we were very excited to learn recently that we've had a proposal accepted for a gallery here in Melbourne. Um, so we've, um, and it's part of something called Collingwood Yards, which is a new arts precinct here in Melbourne. Um, and um, so later, be, before the end of the year, we will have an exhibition, collective exhibition on these projects. Um, and we are um, hoping to also do something in Sydney. Um, and um, as Alice has mentioned, um, Alice and I certainly have an ongoing um, a number of projects that we're working on in relation to the porous borders. So we do have quite a lot of things and we've talked about writing together as well. Um, so there's lots of things that we are, we are, we can do, but um, I'll very, very quickly answer just on behalf of myself in terms of working with Indigenous knowledges and um, certainly in Australia there's uh, been a lot of discussion and a lot of I, uh, thinking around the notion of who does the work um, and who does the work of reconciliation or um, not uh, Indigenous knowledges is not just at the feet of Indigenous people. Um, it's really important that non-Indigenous people do that work and take the time and do the homework and put in the hours to actually do the research and speak on behalf of reconciliation as well. So in, in a kind of Australian sense, it's about working with our mob, other non-Indigenous folks to, um, to bring about dialogue and reconciliation. So it's, it's, some, it's something that's a shared responsibility and that's, that would be my response. Alice, have you any like to add to that? Yes, I mean, it's it's a kind of question that I could spend a long time thinking about. I think that um, indigenous approaches are complicated and need to be co-authored um, with indigenous communities in a very localized way. So I feel like I'm influenced by um, working with peers, artist peers, for me, um, working with Māori peers and artists and working in te reo, te reo Māori. We've worked a little bit in Mapundungun, the uh, Mapuche language in Chile and incorporated that into the project and worked with Mapuche um, artists. But I feel like in terms of our project, we, we think about I, I almost feel like our indigenous work, part of, for, for me, as um, as a Pākehā or a white European and New Zealander, trying to resist colonialism. It's, it, for me, is much about resistance, resisting the sense that one culture or one language um, 
or one ontology can own a territory and to think really carefully around how we're thinking about that and to know that in a way for me I feel like I'm always destined to fail because it's very hard um, to truly like my my Māori is pretty terrible as a speaker uh, and I do my best you know so you're always doing your best and it's always complicated and place is complicated it's layered um, so for me it's very much about attempt and about care um, and about trying to rewrite the the kind of white supremacist <laughs> foundations that I think a lot of our um, traditional maps and our ideas around ownership um, are based predicated on um, I just wanted to say that I have put my email and um, the website into the chat. So if anybody wants to look further into the project or look at some more of the artwork, they can do that on the website. And please, anyone, feel free to email me with any questions, further thoughts, notes on the site. Um, I would love to hear more. And I'm sorry that we've um, had so little time because everything sort of runs over and then you lose those little bits of time. But yeah, I'm happy to continue conversations. And Great. for me, that's also part of the Indigenous approach is reciprocity and keeping those long term connections over time um, is really important rather than just doing the project and then it's over. It's never over. It's a lifelong work, <laughs> lifelong set of relationships. Mm. Great. Thank you. Um, uh, Alex and Ilaria, you'd like to say? Um, yes, I would like to say something about the, you know, the relationship with um, um, indigenous knowledges. And as Ali said, they need to be very localized. So that's why, for instance, in, uh, you know, in our work, we refer specifically to um, uh, the, the language group or, or the peoples in the country we are in so um rather than you know going for a general aboriginal relationship we would try to uh, establish a relationship with gadigal people and so on that said um it is a really um it is a really difficult question um and i think it is a very fine line between uh respecting acknowledging recognizing country learning from country learning with country and appropriating indigenous knowledges so we are overly conscious not to be extractive which is you know it would be another layer of colonialism so um yeah it is a dance on this very very fine line that can only it needs to be continuously renegotiated and we need to continue to learn on you know how to do it properly really and maybe there is no way to do it properly mm. yeah the, the only thing i would just like to add to that quickly is that um i feel so ec excited to be living in a time when these turns are happening in many disciplines and to be a scholar at a time when decolonization of the university is so important. Um, so there's a lot to read as one thing to do. There's a incredible, in Australia certainly, there's incredible Indigenous scholarship being published at the moment, um, incredible work being done. And as Linda mentioned, that's one quite straightforward way to um, engage and learn without burdening uh, Aboriginal people here by reading their work, citing their work, um, really understanding the scholarship that's going on. It's quite radical and transformative. So um, it's certainly something we try to, like all scholarship, it's hard to keep up, but there is some beautiful work. And, and you know, Alaria talked about Uncle Bruce Pascoe, his, his book is definitely worth reading. Um, there's a lot of very, very interesting, I'm from design studies and there's some really interesting um, indigenous design scholars that are really changing what design means in the world and I know that's happening in geography and cultural studies and visual arts and so I just think that's a really great way to start. Right, well, that's right, so I think it's a continuing conversation, a continuing struggle and certainly Living Maps is, is um, you know, is doing it, is trying to do its own bit in a way, fighting its own corner I suppose. 
Um, and certainly there's certain of the issues come up today that we'd, we'd like to follow through um, with, with some of the contributors. Um, I just wanted to, before we go, uh, just to um, uh, tell you about the next event in the series, which is on the 26th of May. Um, and uh, thinking back to <coughs> one of the points that Alice was making, um, it's, going, it's, it's a group of young uh, radical uh, countermappers in Italy who've been looking at how um, official cartographies have been mobilized in, um, in the pandemic, in, in, in telling particular kinds of stories about the nature of the pandemic and, and government responses uh, to it, uh, but also uh, developing a kind of counter-mapping approach to that. So the, the, their session on, on 26th of May, it's called Pandemic Cartographies, Conversation on Mappings, Imaginings and Emotions. Um, so I hope um, you know, you'll all come and uh, join in that conversation and it just really remains for me to to thank uh, Linda, Ilaria, um, Alex and, and Alice uh, so much for, for this quite outstanding uh, and rich um, presentations and I'm sure it's going to um, plant many seeds uh, which will flower in, in various places and times um, and, and, in, and in new projects which is really what, what uh, Living Maps is really supposed to be all about. So again thank you all for coming, thank you all the people from different parts of the world that have joined us and um, see you next time. Oh, we, we, we will have it online, we will, the, it's been recorded so if people have missed it or friends of yours have missed it uh, tell them to look at the Living Maps website in about, uh, about a week's time. Okay. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Yes, thank you. Bye bye. bye. Thank bye. you. Bye, bye. Bye, folks.